David. Uh, morning, everybody. Nice, nice to see some familiar faces and, uh, if I say, long-standing friends. Uh, not old friends, of course, because um, we're all young. Uh, and nice to see some people I don't yet know. But it's a joy to be with you. And um, uh, great to be able to share with people from Harrogate. Uh, as many of you know, I grew up in York. Uh, well, Poppleton, which is the first stop on the Harrogate line out of York, so um, uh, it, it always feels like um, home turf. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. I will make these slides available at the end of the presentation, uh, such as they are, so that if people uh, want to have them for their own reference, then they've got them. Hopefully you can see that. Good. That's what we're thinking about today, uh, the equipping uh, of the saints and I will be coming uh, uh, a little bit later on to that passage that we had read for us from Ephesians 4 but I want to begin uh, with a different uh, passage so uh, it's the day of Pentecost uh, and a bewildered crowd of pilgrims from Jewish communities across the Roman world uh, are looking on a small number of their fellow Jews who appear to have been taken over by some bizarre phenomenon uh, the only explanation for it must be that they've been at the wine in a big way. Uh, and despite the early hour, it's only nine o'clock in the morning, they're evidently seriously drunk. Um, in response to the murmurings of the crowd, the apparent leader of the group of drunks begins to explain what is actually happening. It, no, these people are not drunk, he says. It's far too early for that. What we're actually witnessing, says Peter, is the turning of the ages the beginning of the last days, the outpouring of God's spirit. Now, I wonder if we had been uh, responsible for interpreting these events, the coming of the spirit on that first day of Pentecost, which we'll celebrate again in just uh, a few weeks time. I wonder if we might have drawn attention primarily to personal individual experience of those who are recipients. We might talk about the infilling of the spirit, the power of God coming, and it's perfectly legitimate to do so. We tend to focus on those kinds of, of things. People are now hastily going to be rewriting their Pentecost sermons. Um, however, what fascinates me is that Peter chooses to draw attention to another key consequence of what people were witnessing unfolding before their eyes, and he does so by reference to um, a, a scripture from the book of the prophet Joel, one of the key prophecies given about five or six hundred years prior to this event uh, one of the key prophecies of um, the new God's new age new covenant era and let me just read from uh, Acts 2 this is verse 17 Peter says it will be this is what's happening he says is what Joel spoke about in the last days God says I'll pour my spirit out on all humankind your sons and daughters shall prophesy your Young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, men and women, in those days I'll pour my spirit and they'll prophesy. And I'll grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below and so on. It's a really fascinating thing. Peter, so Peter is effectively saying, look, what we're seeing here is the fulfillment of uh, prophecy. We are now in God's last days, the era between um, the uh, coming of Jesus, the, the death, death and resurrection of Jesus, and um, uh, his ascension to the Father's side, and his return in glory. It's the era of the Spirit. The out, and what's happening in this era, which is absolutely distinctive, says Peter, is God's Spirit is now being poured out on all believers. So in the old dispensation, up until now, particular individuals have received God's Spirit, uh, special people, uh, to equip them to do the work of God. The Spirit is poured out on prophets, on kings, on uh, religious leaders, and so on. And, you know, we, we in the Old Testament era, we have accounts of people saying, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. Uh, and, of course, in the case of people like Saul, the first king of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord departs from him. It's a very provisional kind of thing. Particular people are given uh, an equipping from God to do a particular task for a particular season. What's different now, though, is that the Spirit is given without discrimination to all who put their trust in Jesus Christ. And even those who have previously been overlooked are now included in God's blessing. So it's fascinating to me that Peter draws attention to the fact that sons and daughters 
it weren't many of the daughters in the Old Testament era who were included in this. It was the exceptional one. Um, young and old, actually, of course, we today live in a, a, a society which seems to um, celebrate, even worship the cult of the young. Uh, the reverse was the case in, in um, the Jewish culture. You were respected if you were old. Uh, the young tended to be the ones who would be overlooked. Well, in this new era, even the young get to play. Those who haven't sort of served their time, they get included. Jesus himself, of course, chooses a bunch which would probably have included a few teenagers uh, in his uh, band of uh, first followers. And what about the bond servants, those who have no rights, those who uh, are excluded from every uh, aspect of society? They too get to play. The spirit is poured out on all these people. And this is the significant thing. The functions previously reserved for the few are now entrusted to all, notably the ministry of making known God's word. The Spirit of God is given in the Old Testament uh, primarily so that people can speak on behalf of God. So the prophets uh, are called to uh, speak out for God, often reluctantly. Uh, the priests and the kings equally um, have a responsibility to minister God's word. Um, but it's the, if you want to know what God has to say, you have to go to the anointed person, the special person. Um, and of course, that one of the other prophecies that Peter doesn't mention here is from Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 38, where God speaking through Jeremiah says, of course, in, the, in this era, people won't need to go to their neighbor saying, know the Lord, for you will all know me. The spirit will come uh, and uh, give us an inner witness, if you like, to God. Uh, God's word will be put in our hearts and therefore we will all have the capacity to speak out. And, and in that Joel prophecy, we have young and old prophesying dreaming dreams, engaging in the things which are at the heart of what is understood by ministry or leadership or responsibility, or call it what you will. Um, and we might sum summarise it by saying that whereas the Old Testament celebrates the anointed individual, the New Testament celebrates the anointed community. Um, if they sort of the cry of the Old Testament is, thus says the Lord. Uh, maybe the characteristic in the new is that which is those words expressed by uh, the Apostle James in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, where he says, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. There's a sense in which the Spirit is given to all, and therefore the work of discerning what God says is the responsibility of all, and the work of speaking out for God is the responsibility of all. Now, this is all by way of, of, of reminding us that this is the reality that we inhabit. It means that um, in the new covenant, uh, although there is a place for, uh, as it were, leadership, leadership looks a little bit different. Um, so whereas in the old covenant, um, the, the leader did things, shall we say, uh, that others couldn't do and for others, the leader in the new covenant is far more seen as a steward, stewarding the work of God's spirit, enabling everybody to participate. And that means that firstly, all of us have a, you know, even those of us who feel that we're excluded because we're too young or too old or not educated enough or, you know, haven't got what it takes. All of us have a role to play in the ministry and the leadership um, uh, of God in God's kingdom. Some of us will exercise it in the life of the church. Others might do it in a workplace context or in a voluntary sector, uh, voluntary um, society um, in our street. But the fact of the matter is that all of us, because we have the spirit of God, are um, entrusted uh, by God in a share in his ministry and in leadership, which is fundamentally about ensuring that the things that matter to God are done. So if you came to this session thinking, well, it, I, it'll be interesting, but I'm not a leader. I want you to think again. Um, but I also want you to think about what we mean when we talk about leadership in the New Testament. What is the purpose of, of leadership or ministry? And it's not as it was in the Old Testament, you know, being a heroic individual, doing things that other people can't do. It's actually probably doing things in such a way that other people are equipped uh, to do what they are called to do. And we'll unpack this as we go along. So um, I suppose the Apostle Paul develops this idea here, articulates all these truths. Um, 
when he explains the nature of the church as being the body of Christ, I appreciate this is this is a mechanical image rather than an organic image here. But um, you know, in a sense, uh, in any um, organism or uh, organization, if you take one key cog out, then the whole thing falls apart, and that's really what's integral to Paul's understanding um, of the church as the body of Christ. We're all we all have a part to play. There are no passengers. There are no. There are not special people who do things and others who have things done unto them. We all have a part to play. The spirit. Uh, works in all of us even if we feel that we're not very significant actually Jesus makes us significant one of my favorite scriptures a total aside but in Acts 4 you'll probably remember the story of Peter and John being arrested and being because of healing a, 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 a lame man and then preaching about Jesus and they're hauled before the Jewish council who tick them off seriously and uh, Peter of course begins to preach to them and uh, Luke in Acts 4 has this lovely little um, uh, reflection. He says that, you know, the, the, the Jewish leaders were astonished because these were uneducated men. They were unqualified. They weren't they didn't fit the bill, but they recognized them as having been with Jesus. When Jesus, by his spirit, is involved in our lives, then those who are unqualified become qualified uh, and, and fit and equipped to uh, play a full part in the life and ministry of God's kingdom which brings us neatly to um, uh, Ephesians 4. Um, this is where these truths are articulated at some length by the Apostle Paul and uh, this probably helps us understand something of the, um, the, the calling of those who are called to be leaders and I've suggested already that that probably includes most of us uh all of us ha 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 are called to exercise influence in some way we might so you know we might be leading a church we might be leading a home group we might be leading a ministry area we might just be um leading a, a couple of people who have come to faith recently through an alpha course and we're we're trying to nurture them that's leadership that you know, leadership is actually uh, deploying ourselves in such a way that we can bring the best out of others that's really i think at the heart of leadership that's what paul says here and, and so paul says you know god gave some uh, and he appointed some to have particular uh, roles or ministries in the church not so that they would look special and people could think, phew, I'm glad we've got apostles and prophets because we don't need to do anything. Far from it. He gave some for the equipping of all the saints. So leadership, at whatever level it's exercised, is not, you know, if, if you're a small group leader in your church, the expectation is not that you provide for the needs of others, that you are such a great teacher or Bible study leader that people think, oh, I so love going to Ian's, you know, home group because we just get fed so rich. We, 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 we always come away with so much, you know, more knowledge and insight. And so that's really not what um, a good home group leader does. A good home group leader, an effective one, may not be a great, you know, teacher or not, not be the, the, the sharpest sort of um person you know in, in 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 the in the bunch but is really good at helping people grow in their own walk with god so people come away thinking wow i've now got the confidence to speak to my neighbors about jesus or uh you know i now understand a little more that uh, i get to play when it comes to praying for those who are sick or in need or whatever you see that you know our task whatever we're doing the question should be how can i deploy myself and take what God has given me so that I can bring the best out of others. I can grow others. So Paul says he, God, uh, um, Jesus gave some for the equipping of all, so that all could engage in the work of service. So the body will be built up because the body is built up, not when you've got a few, a small number of really capable, strong leaders, um, but rather when you've got a, a, a motivated workforce so that we can come to maturity. What does maturity consist of? It consists of the whole body of Christ, uh, every single member, young and old, um, uh, slave and free in Paul's context, uh, understanding their calling and, and using their gifts. And that's what the proper working of the whole body uh, looks like. And it's interesting, actually, that's probably why the New Testament writers 
uh, when they chose words to describe their leaders, um, picked on words which had something of um, that overtone, the overtone of uh, a focus on equipping others. So, you know, one of the words, again, this is a Greek word, the word episkopos, which we often translate bishop, uh, but it means overseer. Uh, you know, we get our word episcopal uh, um, um, from uh, that root. Well, the episcopos was the leader of a household, one of whose responsibilities was to make sure that everybody in the household um, was fed, uh, thrived, flourished, reached their own full sort of, you know, uh, mature place as a, as, a, as a human being. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that's the kind of... Um, so, whereas in the Old Testament, many of the words used for leaders, like priests, for example, tended to focus on the unique function of that person. These are not words that the New Testament writers use. The words they use are very much words which focus on bringing the best out of others or, or enabling others to thrive. Um, they're, they're very much um, uh, devoid of any sort of sense of uh, having a, a particular status or, or whatever. And the primary responsibility of the leader in the New Testament is to animate, bring to life the whole body. Um, Aaron S. Lydia Dunn once um, said this, and I've always felt this is a really great quote. A good leader, she said, is one who leaves behind women and men who possess the conviction and the will to carry on without them. If you like, a good leader is, uh, is somebody who does themselves out of a job. And um, it seems to me this is a, a vital responsibility for leaders at any and every level in the church and in the, the workplace. I mean, it may be that, that so for example, uh, it might be that you are a school teacher, let's say, and uh, maybe you have responsibility for other members of staff. And there are two ways of approaching that responsibility. One is to think I'm going to jolly well impress them with how good I am uh, and, uh, you know, uh, provoke them to jealousy because I'm, I've got sparkier teaching materials than them. Or you can think, gosh, you know, I've learned a little bit about teaching, but I can see the potential in these young teachers coming through. Wouldn't it be great if I could pass on my experience to them in such a way that they become better teachers than me because that improves the educational experience of children going forward? Or it might be that you are leading children's ministry um, or some other ministry area in the life of your church, the prayer ministry team, perhaps. And it might be that you think, ah, uh, wouldn't it be great if people could see how accomplished I am in this? I, you know, it's taken me years to get to this point. I've been to so many seminars and courses and so on. Or you could think, gosh, I can really see that Jane, who's just joined the team, fairly new Christian, but has really, you know, there's something there. If I could just fan into flame what God is doing, she could be, she could outstrip me and then I could hand the team over to her and uh, we could go to a whole different places in terms of the ministry that we're um, uh, offering. It's a development thing. God gifts us so that we can uh, enable others to become more uh, than they otherwise would be. This is certainly the self-understanding, it seems to me, of the New Testament church. So the Apostle Paul, writing to the Colossians, uh, Colossians 1, 28, describes his ambition as to present all God's people mature in Christ. And the word he uses because uh, the, uh, the New Testament obviously was written in Greek, the, the Greek word that he uses to, which we translate mature, is the word teleos, which really means fit for purpose uh, or suitable, equipped, if you like. So Paul is saying that my goal is to make sure that everybody is properly equipped. And so a good question for us, whatever our level of experience, responsibility, whether it's formal or informal, is to say, so how can I play my part? in growing others how can i enable others to become more equipped to engage more fully in all that god has for them so I, th those are some what you might call theological reasons why it makes sense um whoever we are where we find ourselves to invest uh, in others but i'm thinking there might be some practical reasons too um and I thought we could go into small groups for 10 minutes just to reflect on this question. Um, what might be some of the most compelling practical reasons for giving time and attention to the work of growing and developing others? OK, uh, I've given you the theological, spiritual reasons, but um, 
think of your own experience of what the difference might be between let's say a leader or people with responsibility just doing things for people or growing others what might be some of the most compelling practical reasons for doing for engaging in this for seeing our task as growing others now, i'm going to stop share and i think linda's going to put us into groups for 10 minutes i came out in your group uh, so that others can benefit from them. for those who can't be bothered to type or don't like chat you know uh, you might it'd be great just to hear just two or three things what, what what did you come up with in terms of what might be some of the most compelling practical reasons for giving time and attention to work growing and developing others who wants to um just unmute mute yourself and uh, pitch in or as i post in chat anybody want to tell us something that came out of their group yeah, I can share something, Ian, if that's helpful. Cheers, Mike. Nice to see you, by the way. Welcome to the <laughs> North. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, one of the things about uh, that's very compelling and practical is, um, I, as a leader, I'm very aware of my um, limitations. Uh, and seeing people around who are far more gifted uh, and able, uh, is, it, it becomes very compelling <laughs> to release them into their gifts and their abilities so that they can help. Uh, the body of Christ uh, in ways that I could only dream of doing mm. but as they do that it also helps me to grow as well uh, yeah. so you can fully understand why Paul would uh, put this across as a, a good way of um, being a, a leader that's really helpful I mean that we're just picking up one thing there my about limitations I mean that's the, the, the fact of the matter that most churches or organizations or workplaces uh, if you have a leader who doesn't recognize their limitations, then those limitations become the thing that hold you back. Uh, no matter how, what strengths you've got, um, you know, it's like the staves of a barrel. Uh, you can only fill a barrel up to the height of the lowest stave. Uh, and um, so actually, if we can find other people who are better than us in those key areas, then you've got a chance of fruitfulness. And some great stuff coming out of the chat, by the way um so helping others find their talents and vocations again that's a key part of the now ruth mentioned succession planning which i think is absolutely critical to this if if we i mean most of us have been in churches where you know uh, somebody has um you know we might have a friday night youth ministry which is great but then the, the person who is running it has to um it suddenly gets a job down in cardiff and so you know to hand it on and so the vicar gets up on sunday and saying says oh you know helen and john are moving down to cardiff and they've done such a great job with the friday night youth club but it's going to have to close unless somebody comes forward to you know to, to take it on and people are thinking oh not me not youth I, you know but oh okay i'll have a go kind of thing um whereas if helen and john when they took on that youth work a year ago or 18 months ago had been it, it had been impressed upon them that one of the key things they were to do were to grow a team uh, to which they could ultimately hand on that's uh, you know uh, you you have this seamless transition so that's um uh, uh planning is really important um one person trying to do it all burns out <laughs> absolutely yeah um and uh lots of interesting things about diversity and leadership how do we minimize the gap between leaders and the led how do we that's, I mean, that's a, um, David's question is a really important one. We, we probably haven't got time to go into that, but I, except to say that if we do grow others and we, grow, we, we have a, a much more shared approach to leadership, we could probably minimise the risk of hobby horsing or, you know, uh, the leader going off at a, at a tangent or whatever. Um, um, Stuart, is a, nice to see you again, Stuart. <laughs> uh, it is a... Um, uh, a big challenge um, and I suppose you know leadership burnout uh, somebody once described the, the, the church to me he said it's rather like a football match um, in the days when people could watch football matches he said you know um, 22 people in need of arrest being watched by several thousand in need of exercise and that sometimes is the case with the, with the church uh, you know that um, too few people it's a far cry isn't it from the the new testament picture of the body of christ um well bob's thing on a reflection on 
of it is a, is an interesting one. You know, um, some churches have relied on paying people. We no longer have the resources to do that. This might be a real God moment for us, actually. It, you know, um, uh, paying people to do things is always a short term thing. Um, so lots of stuff. Any other things that people want to just chip in with um, verbally uh, before we move on? Uh, just to say, Jeffrey, hi. Um, it, it's not. It's not simple. Does anybody remember the episode of The Simpsons where Marge volunteers to help <laughs> the minister? Did you? you you're smiling. Ian. Did you? Did you? Have you watched that? <laughs> Probably some time ago now. But yeah, go and remind me. <laughs> well, she's so good. She's so efficient. <laughs> <laughs> the poor guy feels threatened uh, and surpassed, and in the end, uh, I think, if, I, if I'm remembering it right, uh, in the end, she very graciously agrees to <laughs> step down because she's completely undermining his ministry. So it, it's it's not, uh, it, I, yeah, it's great, it's great, but I do think there is a it is a particular gift to be the sort of minister who can empower people uh, and not find yourself threatened. Um, uh, or feel threatened anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's very honest. I mean, uh, and that leads us neatly into our next section, really. I mean, here's a. Um, I uh, do think that. Um, well, we're going to think in a minute. Uh, well, let's think now. Uh, if I'm going, we're going to. I'm going to screen share again. Um, can you see, am I screen sharing or can you, can you see that? No, I don't think you can, can you? Not yet. No, uh, let me, right, this happens sometimes, right, here we go. Yeah. There we go, yeah, it just gets the wrong thing, right. So, I, I want to think about this question now, uh, Jeffrey's kind of highlighted it, why do we so often neglect the vital task of developing others into ministry and leadership? What are the specific things which work to give us uh, keep us from giving time and energy to developing others now um it may it might be that we are we do have key leadership responsibility as a uh, um, a minister or a, a leader or in some way um it might be that we uh are under engaged in particular tasks <laughs> where, where we have responsibility for people leading a, a small group or, or whatever it might be that we don't really have any of those formal tasks, in, in, in which case we might just want to reflect on the practice of others, especially the practice in our own local church. Uh, so um, we might want to um, think not so much about why we do it, but why, um, the, the, why this task is neglected. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have a little poll. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'll stop sharing my screen. And... Um, Linda's going to launch a poll and uh, you have you can vote I think for did I say two can they vote for two of these Linda or three I could only set it so that either you could you could multiple choice as many as you like or one okay. so okay. if you say to people that they just choose what do you want two three yeah I think if you want to choose two uh, here are here are ten reasons specific things which tend to prevent time and energy being given to leadership development what do you think are the top two or three and you can uh, we'll say you can vote for three how about that uh and just vote when you want and then we'll see what um have a look through them and uh, we've got some votes coming in there And I'm going to suggest we've got about another 30 seconds to vote. So get your votes in. Get your votes in. Can you all see the votes? Can you all see the poll? OK, good. I can't, actually. I don't know quite why, but it's... Uh, I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got questions one and two and, and then oh, two you... copies of three, two copies of five and yeah. seven. Oh, and yes, I had copies. Uh, my, my, the numbers are different. That uh, Oh, gosh. Anyway, no, well... Sorry, I'm just going to say the whole thing's disappeared for me. I don't know if that's the same for anyone else. Uh, 
if everyone else can see it that's fine we've got it might be to do with what view you're on yeah i'm talking yeah. around but it's fine as long as everybody else can see it that's okay that's fine right just, still coming in. just get your votes in okay Oh, they're coming in thick and fast yeah, now. We're going out. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay, now shall we end the poll? Okay. Right. Are we going to publish it? Yeah, the results. All right. So it's interesting, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. The um, people expect the the leader the pastor the priest to do all the work of leadership and the leader and the leader doesn't want to give the appearance of abdicating responsibility that's a big thing um that um you know sometimes uh, we feel uh, if we have responsibility especially if we're paid golly what will happen you know if um if I, if I don't do this what will people think so i've got to look busy uh and um we sometimes meet people's expectations and uh, you know it's that's a really telling thing. I remember in my first um, incumbency, which was over in Saltburn on the coast, um, and uh, a church which, when I got there, for 124 years of its history, had expected the vicar to do everything. Uh, uh, but we, you know, the, the, the time I was there was really a time of growing uh, lay leadership. In fact, I ended up handing over to a lay leadership team who led the church during the two year vacancy um and uh which followed my uh incumbency there and in which time the church grew but I, I, as we were doing it this you know people would sometimes say to us i don't know what you do these days ian and uh, you could, sometimes you could tell that people it was slightly barbed from some uh but um the, the temptation to look busy is a, a a big one and sometimes of course for some of us, our identity, our sense of value is tied up with performance. Um, we need to be set free from that. Uh, insufficient time to give to this because of urgent demands of ministry. Administration is a big one. Well, I think that is a big one, actually. Uh, you know, we will focus on growing others when, when the quieter day comes, but the quieter day never comes. And actually, the only way we can actually uh, enable a quieter day to come is to, <laughs> is to hand things on, to grow people to, to do things. A shortage of potential leaders. Yeah, that it, uh, people are often in, in this day and age more time poor than they used to be. Or um, many churches. I mean, my role in the Diocese of Sheffield is um, very much focused on growing others in uh, and releasing others in leadership and ministry and helping clergy transition to a different way of operating. Uh, but I go to some churches and, you know, I think they've almost missed the boat in terms of uh, the available talent pool now uh you look around and think i'm not sure you know who could be raised up here um but then i go back to acts 2 and i realize that you know um god gives gifts to everybody irrespective of our age background uh, experience rowan williams uh, once memorably said something like this it's slightly paraphrased this but he said we need to uh, hold on to the uh, conviction that god gives to the church everything the church needs to be the church and to do the things the church is called to do i you know we may not have very much but we have to believe that god gives us what we need uh, and calls people to do what needs to be done so that's really interesting isn't it it's interesting reflecting on these because um um uh sorry i'm just cut off. uh reflecting on uh what gets in the way is often an important step to beginning to address that and moving to a place where we actually do focus more on um uh doing the things that really matter okay we're screen sharing again um <laughs> Somebody put it to me like this once. Imagine that you're standing in front of your house <coughs> and it's on fire. It's seriously on fire. In your hand, you have one bucket of water. On the ground next to you are 12 sleeping firefighters. And this is the question. Where do you throw the water? Um, and, 
when we think of those objections that uh, people give, often, it, it, you know, it's very counterintuitive, isn't it? To, to, we have, don't have very many resources. In fact, our experience of you most of the time in my, in my experience of, of, of um, parish ministry is that we never have the resources to do what needs to be done. Uh, there's always more. Um, the, the demands will always massively outweigh our capacity. Um, and we feel, you know, even if we deploy ourselves fully and spend ourselves uh, to the point of exhaustion, we might not make much difference. We, we think it's the faithful thing to do, but actually, you know, uh, we throw our water on the fire, but it doesn't really damp the flames down. It's very counterintuitive to turn our backs on the fire, even for a moment, and wake up, you know, throw it somewhere else. But actually, that might be the most strategic thing that we do. Whatever level of responsibility we have, um, think not how can I do something that will, you know, look good or might be useful, but rather how can I wake up others? How can I multiply the, the task force? And of course, that's exactly what Jesus does. And so in this um, final sort of uh, 15 minutes of my material, I want to think a bit about the example of Jesus and, and what, how we learn from Jesus. Because as in so many things when it comes to the Egyptian ministry, he really is our model. And um, especially in Luke's gospel, we see Jesus on a journey <coughs> in which, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, from calling um, some unlikely people through to releasing uh, his uh, and multiplying his ministry through them. So I've, I've just identified sort of eight stages, really, on the um, uh, in terms of how Jesus uh, models what it is to grow leaders. And the first is this, he calls people to follow. Um, and I suppose what we might say is that in doing so, he's extending a very wide invitation. He's casting the net wide. Luke 5 is the account, Luke's account of the call of Peter. And uh, um, we, the, the story is relatively familiar to us, I guess. Uh, Jesus is preaching. A large crowd is pursuing him. Uh, Peter has been fishing during the night without any success and he's cleaning his nets prior to probably a bit grumpy, going, prior to going to bed and getting some sleep and then going out the, the next night to fish. Jesus asks Peter if he can go into his boat uh, and uh, because then he can pull out from the shore and then the crowd can't push him any further. Uh, Peter despite you know, that his reluctance accedes to Jesus request and then Jesus says um, why don't you throw your nets out you know for a catch and this is really not good uh, Peter is grumpy uh, because he's just tidied his nets ready for the next night and anyway the fish haven't been biting and it's midday and the fish don't come to the surface so it's pointless fish, you know fishing now but for whatever reason, he accedes to Jesus' request, throws the net out, massive catch of fish, put, hauls them in, whereupon Peter, recognising that he is in the presence of something um, monumental, falls at Jesus' feet and basically says, look, if you knew the kind of person I was, you wouldn't really want to be doing anything with me. Whereupon Jesus, of course, says, um, follow me, and from now on you'll be catching people. Um, now, we know the end of Peter's story, and we tend to interpret the beginning in the light of the end, but I'm not sure it was quite so cut and dried. Uh, at this stage in Jesus' ministry, he is extending uh, a wide invitation to a lot of people, just drawing a crowd. In fact, there's a big crowd following him. One of the ironies of this story for me is that there's a crowd of really keen people who are pursuing Jesus, and Peter's not in that crowd. Uh, he's a practical man. He's a fisherman. He's doing his job. He's sitting, cleaning his nets. Um, you know, we don't know what kind of, um, he certainly has no sense of being a particularly holy person himself. He's the kind of person who we might overlook, but he's the one whom Jesus uh, um, selects in, in the end. And I, I suppose I, I, what I learned from this is the importance of not overlooking people. Um, Peter um, doesn't have many of the qualifications that we might think were uh, fundamental to being a member of this um, new sort of band of disciples. But what he does seem to have is a willingness to obey. I guess that's what Jesus latches onto in him. You know, he's willing to put out from the shore, even though it's inconvenient. When Jesus says, why don't you throw your nets out? Peter responds to Jesus' bidding. And I wonder if Jesus sees in him a teachable spirit, 
you know, an openness to to Jesus leading. Um, and it's only in a sense by um, giving him opportunity that that is tested and proved. And I suppose I've tried to learn from that in my own experience that um, I have my own expectations, perhaps, of what people might look like who might take on responsibility. But I need to extend the invitation widely to give everybody an opportunity to step up uh, to prove themselves. That's what Jesus does. But the second thing that Jesus does is he gives people a vision for what they might become. Follow me, he says to Peter, and from now on, you'll be catching people. One of the key things we can do as those who are involved in the lives of others at whatever level is enable them to see what God might be doing in them. Um, I remember in uh, my last uh, church, one of the first things I wanted to do, uh, because again, I, I went with the conviction that I needed to do myself out of a job and grow ministry and others. And But one of the first things I wanted to do was to establish a team who would take responsibility for the baptism ministry. Um, you know, we had families, largely unchurched families, coming asking about baptism, and we did baptism preparation with them. It was a sort of an introduction to Christian faith, and so we wanted to build relationship. And it was quite a fruitful ministry, ultimately. But I, I knew that, although it relied on the clergy up to that point, we needed to get a team. This was an area of ministry that could be devolved. So I began to put a team together. I, one of the people I asked was somebody who was a helper in our church nursery, a uh, member of the church, uh, somebody without much self-confidence and probably uh, didn't have much, I mean, other people hadn't really uh, expressed much confidence in this person either. And when I asked her if she would be part of the team, she, she said, why on earth would you ask me? <laughs> uh, so I said, well, because I think you have the gift of an evangelist. I said, what on earth do you mean? And I said, well, whenever we have a, any invitation event at church, you bring people. It's, you know, from talking to you, every time you catch a bus, it seems to me, the person you sit next to, you end up sharing your faith with them. And so she said, well, doesn't everybody do that? Uh, so I said, well, no, but you do. And anyway, so she became part of the team. Brilliant. Uh, outstanding member, just great at getting alongside people. Um, and I was able to, to talk to her about what I saw in her that she didn't see and hadn't been called out. One of the key things we can do is to enable people to see, because they might not see it, but we might, what God is doing in them, what gifts God is giving them. And not just what he's doing already, but what God might do with them. Um, this is not sort of just, you know, possibility thinking. This is actually seeing people through the eyes of Christ and enabling them to see themselves in the light of what he, uh, who he is and what he might do with them. And then, of course, Jesus prays for wisdom in selecting those in whom to invest. So in Luke 6, he goes up on a mountain for a night uh, and asks the father who, are the, who should be the 12 that he would journey with particularly. Uh, and um, we might not spend a whole night praying over this, but it's a good thing to do. Maybe, you know, we are responsible for uh, a ministry area uh, or a home group or a department in a school or whatever it might be um you know it might be worth saying to the lord is there a particular person whom you would like me to spend time uh over the next months passing on to them what you have passed on to me who are those whom i might grow in such a way that they might outstrip me uh and um who might run with the stuff that uh, you've given to me that I can then pass on to them. It's exactly what Jesus does. And then, of course, Jesus shares his life with them. Part of growing people is as simple as this, helping other people see, for example, how we deal with conflict situations, how we respond when the chips are down, um, how we order our own personal life and our walk with God. Um, and that often comes about by just, you know, maybe going for a walk with somebody and ask them how they're doing or ask them how their prayer life is or whatever it might be. But the people begin to see uh, something of Jesus. I'm guessing for us that the things that have grown us have been the opportunity to hang out with others and something of them has rubbed off on us. We thought, I really would like to pray like Linda prays or whatever, you know, and uh, I would really, um, you know, um, 
you know, Mike just seems to uh, know his Bible. So I wonder how he reads his Bible. Maybe if I ask him, he can just show me how I could get more out of it and so on. Um, it, I, um, when I was uh, much younger and doing a lot of youth work, um, I used to like to, you know, uh, uh, again, I'd ask for wisdom at any particular time. Is there a particular member of the youth group that I should be journeying with at this time? And I might just take them under my wing for a bit and invite them to do things with me. Uh, I decorated with them or gardened with them or, you know, just did stuff. But it's a way of just entering into conversation and allowing something to rub off on them in a particular way. And Jesus, above all, begins to model leadership and ministry as they hang out with him. They see him doing things. Um, whatever we are doing, I just this a little while ago in my own uh, when I was in, in a parish. I recognized that most of the thing there were very few things I did that couldn't be done with other people. So if we're doing something, you know, maybe we're praying, for, uh, we're involved in prayer ministry or maybe we're involved well in anything that's, that's sort of, you know, leadership or ministry focused it's a good question to think to ask who could i do this with who could come and shadow me who could just come alongside me and i can show them how i do this um so often you know uh, the clergy tell me they haven't got time to train others so i say to them well why don't you just then do what you do but ask other people to step in to do it with you uh, so they can see what you're doing. That use your ministry as a, a a learning opportunity, so that people can, you know, different people can see different things. How can I uh, enable people to learn from what I have learned? And then Jesus gives them opportunities to have a go. So in Luke nine and ten, he sends firstly the twelve, and then the seventy-two out uh, on a short-term mission. It's a safe space. Uh, he basically says to them, "You've seen me do it. Now you go and do it," um, and gives them clear instructions. And it's a time limited, you know, it's a good thing to do. Um, you know, it might be that we, for example, running a, a kids holiday club at church. Or something. That's a great time to look for people who, you know, for three days can just join the team. And, it, you know, if they're not very good, then nothing is lost. Um, but it might be that they, we, as we watch them, we think, oh, golly, you know, they're really good. You know, they might be good with children, but they might be good with people. And it might be that they could engage in a different kind of, you know, uh, area of service and so on. But as we watch people, we, um, we we see those who are able to fly. And again, it's worth thinking, what are the opportunities we could create for people to do things? We, in my last church, we used to do a thing from time to time called a call to worship talk. And it was a three or four minute talk at the beginning of the service. Uh, and we would look for somebody, often people who we thought maybe had the beginnings of a teaching gift or somebody wanted to try out. And it was, you know, one scripture, one story, um, one thought. It was just three or four minutes. If it was desperate, it didn't really matter because then the worship group could pick up and it would be fine. If it was good, then we got off to a good start. And if it, they did it really well, we might ask them a few weeks later to do it again. And we use members of the youth group and various other people in this way. And if people did it really, really well, then I might say to them, gosh, you know, how would you fancy tag preaching with me? And tag preaching was, uh, we would prepare a sermon together. We'd, you know, I'd, I'd go through how I prepared a sermon. We'd, we'd read a passage from scripture, study it, uh, and then pool our thoughts. And I'd talk about how you structured a sermon. And we'd get a three-point sermon. And I'd do the first bit. They'd do the middle bit. I'd do the last bit and so on. And we did it together. And it was a safe space to for people to start out on that kind of ministry. I, I did that with a couple of members of the youth group. We did it with others who uh, we wanted to bring on. But again, you know, looking for safe ways in which we can begin to introduce people um, you know, it's far better than saying, oh, I see you've got a gift with children. How about running the Sunday school for the next 40 years? You know, uh, it's a sort of a uh, th th that's why people are fearful of taking on responsibility, because they, they fear that they're going to be landed with it forever. Um, a limited, you know, uh, a, a defined area. Give them an opportunity to, to try out. And then most importantly, Jesus reflects with them. Um, I'm imagining that many of us have had experience of being asked to do things and the person who's asked us to do, do things has then said, I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine uh, and that's great and, you know, just get on with it. And then we don't hear from them for three years, you know, they don't say you're doing a great job or how's it going. You know, reflecting with people is a key part of growth. So if we are responsible for anybody else, always reflect regularly. 
if we've asked somebody to speak or if we're a vicar, we've asked somebody to preach, reflect with them, give them some feedback, help them understand. You know, we feel affirmed. We feel as if our what we do matters when somebody takes an interest in helping us do it better. And then, of course, ultimately, Jesus releases them uh, and says, you know, it's to your advantage. I go away uh, and um, uh, I'm sending the spirit and uh, he will uh, equip you to do all the things that I've been doing. And. I suppose that brings us back to Pentecost and uh, the actual release of those uh, disciples. So, again, we're going to go into um, groups. I, I think we just um, might do five minutes, Linda, in groups, if that's OK. And think particularly of the first question. Think of a leader who's been especially significant in your own releasing and development as a leader or in your own Christian life and ministry. What did you find most helpful in the way they treated you? And the reason we want to reflect on this is if that has made a difference for you, chances are if you replicate that to others, that might be most helpful. And so think of somebody who's been especially significant in your own releasing and development so as a leader or as a Christian. And what did you find most helpful in the way they treated you? Linda's going to send us into groups for just five minutes. And then we're going to come back uh, and uh, reflect all together. OK. Yeah, I've just put the question into the chat box. Thank as well. you. Here well you done. go into your rooms.